This is a case of a symptomatic complex tentorial fistula that highlights the limitations that may exist with liquid embolic agents and the advantages in certain situations of using a transvenous chorioembolization. A 41-year-old woman with a past medical history of bipolar disorder, tobacco use, Chiari malformation type 1, status post, posterior fossa, decompression, presented with symptoms of headaches, dizziness, vertigo, and broods that started one year after surgery. Her neurological exam was normal. Imaging investigation with MRI, MRA, and a CTA reveal a likely vascular structure near the left tutorial and ambient system region most likely representing a dilated vein. Based on the patient's clinical symptoms and imaging findings, we recommended a diagnostic cerebral angiography. The left external carotid injections show early opacification of a dilated ectatic vein with deep venous drainage. The feeding arteries to the AV fistula coming from the external carotid appear to be the anterior and posterior branches of the middle meningeal artery. Selective left internal carotid injections show enlarged tentorial branches that supply the same ectatic deep cerebral vein. There was no opacification from the right internal and external carotid artery injections or the vertebral basilar circulation injections. Given the patient's recent worsening symptoms and pattern of venous drainage, we decided to proceed with treatment of the dural AV fistula. Open surgery option would involve a temporal craniotomy for a subtemporal approach. We believe that overall surgical risks and the risk for dominant temporal lobe retraction would be greater in an open surgery rather than an endovascular approach. In addition, it's uh, difficult to ascertain from imaging if the fistula's connection is within the tentorium or and ambient cistern. The endovascular treatment option has several variables in regards to the type of access, catheters, and embolic agents that may be used. Ideally, the endovascular treatment of this dural AV fistula would involve a transarterial route and onyx embolization trying to achieve sufficient nidal penetration and obliteration of the fistula with a low morbidity and risk. We started with a transarterial approach through the posterior meningeal feeders on the left, which we thought was a safer approach and provided an opportunity to reach the nidus for occlusion. However, the actual feeders were very narrow and challenged the ability of a marathon microcatheter to achieve close proximity to the nidus. Despite access of two branches, we were not able to achieve sufficient nidal penetration. Even though final control external carotid injections failed to show early venous opacification, follow-up internal carotid injections show, as expected, continual nidal filling. At this point, after failure of transarterial endovascular treatment, we had the option of proceeding with surgery or uh, attempting a transvenous uh, approach. After discussing with the patient, we then decided to take a transvenous approach with chorus alone, with the primary concern that any liquid embolic embolization would inherently entrap the microcatheter to some degree, and removal of the microcatheter may cause injury to the very torturous dilated ectatic deep vein. Fortunately, the nidus was fairly discreet, and using a triaxial system with a marathon microcatheter, intermediate catheter at the apex of the straight sinus, and a guide catheter just below it, we were able to access the nidus and place severally dense packed coils to achieve complete obliteration. Clinically, the patient tolerated the procedure well and has been seen in follow-up six months later, neurologically intact and with improvement of her initial symptoms. In summary, the anatomic features of this tentorial fistula made liquid embolic embolization potentially problematic and showed a valuable role of a transvenous core embolization to achieve definitive cure.